where we're gonna start. Um, we are gonna begin our conversation here. We're gonna kick off with hearing and talking about and with the agencies that have the greatest impact uh, on our Utah healthcare environment. And with that, I'm going to invite our opening speaker, Nate Jekitz, uh, who is the Deputy Director of the Department of Health and Human Services. Nate, do you wanna come on up and we'll get started on the discussion. Yeah, thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, State of Reform, for hosting this and for HMA uh, for bringing this all together. Uh, my name is Nate Chekets. I'm a deputy director at the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, some of you, I know many of your faces, and uh, we've worked together for many of your, many years. Uh, some of you may not know me well, so I'll just give a brief introduction and then go ahead and move into my remarks. Uh, my area of responsibility at Health and Human Services includes the Medicaid program, uh, substance use, uh, services for people with disabilities and uh, services uh, for people that are aging. Uh, our department covers a broad swath of services in the state. We have 6,200 employees, about a third of the state employees. Uh, we have a budget of uh, about $7 billion, which again is about a third of the state budget. Uh, we also include services uh, for individuals in the prison. Uh, we include services, child welfare services, and a variety of other parts of our program. For those who, who know me and, and those who don't, you may not know that uh, I was a high school wrestler. Uh, and as I was talking to a few people uh, ahead of time, uh, that does not involve a mask or a cape or a ring, uh, you know, with ropes. Uh, so maybe take all those images out of your mind if you were going there. Um, I wrestled, they have weight classes in, in high school wrestling. I wrestled uh, 154 pounds to 165 pounds. I'm nowhere near that now, obviously. Um, we'll just we'll get that stated. Um, wrestling is, is an individual sport, obviously. Two individuals that go into the, into the, to have the match. Um, there's a variety of ways in high school wrestling that you can s score points. Uh, you can take down the other person. You can, when you're, when you're, uh, when you have been taken down, you can get reversal. And all those things score you points. One thing that you cannot have happen in wrestling is you cannot get your shoulder blades pinned to the mat. Uh, if that happens, if they hold you there for three seconds, it's over. So you can be far behind, far ahead in many things, but if you get pinned in wrestling, high school wrestling, that's not good, that your match is over. High school wrestling is broken into three two-minute uh, periods where you go through, so if you get stuck in, in a position, you often have an opportunity to come back in the next round and maybe do a little bit better. And so it is this series, and sometimes you just try to hold out a little bit to try to get to the next part. As we practiced in high school wrestling, we obviously did practice all of those different moves where we were working with, uh, with those that were on our team uh, to develop better techniques to do takedowns, better techniques to escape. Uh, and one of the things that we worked on a regular basis was if in case we got turned over onto our back, what we could do to not get pinned. Uh, we worked on strengthening our necks, worked on special moves to be able to get out of that position. Now, high school wrestling is also a team sport. So each of those individual matches, you can score points. Uh, and as you do that, uh, that contributes to your team score. Uh, if you win a match, that's worth three points. Uh, but if you win a match by pin, that's six points. So as you're going through those things, there's, there's different strategies that you go about that. Now, my high school team was good but not great. Uh, we were often competed for our league championship in our area, uh, but didn't win it very often. Uh, we did have rivals. Uh, Mission San Jose was one of the schools that we always were trying to beat. And one year uh, when we were set up to do that, my match and that, that match was not very favorable to, for me. Uh, I was, a, very, I was new, a newer wrestler at the time, and the person that I was gonna wrestle in had already been to state championships. Uh, and was known to be a very good wrestler. So my coach, as he was prepping us for this and prepping for the team strategy, he knew like where each of us needed to be in order to, to succeed in this match and be able to win this match. And he gave me the very lofty goal of just don't get pinned. That, that was my goal. I was there, he, that, was, that was his prep talk, pep talk to me, don't get pinned. So I knew where I needed to be on this one. And let me tell you from the start, this isn't a story where I had some miraculous comeback and I beat the state championship, so I can just set that expectation there. 
Um, we, got, as we got out and we got into this match. Um, he was a much more experienced wrestler. I quickly got into situations that were very problematic to, for me, and I ended up on my back uh, very quickly. Uh, but because of my training and because I knew that our team needed me not to get pinned, I kept fighting and made it through uh, the first round, second round. I was hoping it would be a little bit better. It wasn't too much, be much better and I ended up quickly on my back again. But again, because of the training and because of my ability, because of my desire to make sure that I was doing what I needed to do for my team, I managed to escape one more time. The third round comes up and the, my coach was counseling me as we were, we were going into that last round. And he was like, it's okay if he beats you by 15 points and you give up five team points. That's okay, we just can't have you pinned. Um, which again, these, these great confidence builders, right? But he was a realist and I knew I was uh, in a bit of trouble too. And again, I got put on my back and again, managed to survive one more round where I did not get pinned. Um, and even, uh, despite all of the times that I was in trouble, ended up only uh, giving up four points for the team. Um, and and what, the, what one of those things, and our team ended up going on to win that match, and we were super excited that that was something that we were able to do. And we, in the in following years, uh, building on that success, um, our team was able to win the league championship in, in the, the following year. Um, I was able to do much better as I got, gained more experience in future years. Uh, but one of those things that that taught me at that time was that sometimes success is just surviving. Sometimes success is just making it through, being resilient, uh, getting done what has to get done in that moment, which for me in that match wasn't this great thing. It wasn't like I have some victory to talk about. It wasn't that I have um, something particular that I did that was astounding. But in that moment, it was just surviving some very difficult circumstances. Our lives are like those matches in many ways. Um, we face opposition in things we do. Sometimes it's direct opposition. Sometimes things are working directly against our goals. But I find more often than not, it's simply that other things are in our way. Um, and they sometimes just really don't care what we're doing or care about what we're trying to, to accomplish. And they're just on their own path. And that path happens to be blocking or interfering with what we want to do or where we want to go. Like you, our organizations have faced some significant challenges over the last couple of years. Uh, it's been a very uh, involved and demanding environment. Uh, just looking at highlighting some of the things that our Medicaid program alone has faced in the last uh, three or four years. In 2020, we implemented a brand new program. We brought on the Medicaid expansion. Uh, in 2020, we also, like all of you, uh, learned to deal with what the COVID environment was. We sent all of our office workers home remotely and in a single weekend, I don't know if you had this experience, but I'm going into the building and I'm watching what would appear like to be like looting possibly. We had all of our workers carrying their chairs and their computers and their monitors out the door into their cars. It was, um, like you, we experienced that. Uh, in 21, 22, we emerged. Uh, we had a merger. We merged the Department of Health and the Department of Human Services. And any of you who have been through a merger know what that takes uh, with your staff and your leadership uh, to bring teams that are operating in different systems, different plans um, and environments to bring them into a single location. Um, in 2023, uh, we adopted a new IT system uh, with the PRISM system, a new claims payment system for the Medicaid program. Again, any of you that have brought up a new IT system know that that is, requires a tremendous amount of organizational energy to get that done. Also in 23, 24, we ended the COVID provisions, which meant uh, we ended the uh, continuous enrollment that we had for the Medicaid program and went through the unwinding where uh, we reviewed with the Department of Workforce Services the eligibility of over 500,000 individuals. Uh, we're just on the last month of that right now. Uh, and just to keep things interesting, uh, just in the last couple of weeks, uh, with Change Healthcare's outage, uh, that was the that is the pharmacy benefit manager for the Medicaid program in the state of Utah, uh, and that has gone completely uh, offline for the last couple of weeks, and so our program has had to work through how to figure out how to continue delivering services for members uh, when pharmacies cannot uh, check eligibility, cannot get payment, and those things. My hope is that as we focus on the vision uh, and working through this goal of, of seeking to deliver services uh, to all Utahns, 
that we can work through these different opposing forces. And uh, I'm gonna talk through a couple different things that we've experienced in the last uh, couple months related to the legislative session uh, and our goals uh, where we are working through some of these different um, forces that are around us uh, and maybe sometimes uh, maybe appear to be opposing us. Uh, the first one I wanna talk about is uh, House Bill 261, uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Uh, this was a bill that passed early in the session uh, and it had uh, sent some shockwaves through our community about what, what is the state saying, what is the state doing, and what does this mean for our ability to serve all Utahns. Um, for those of you who didn't track the bill closely, there's a few things that the bill prohibited. It prohibited an office based on certain identifying characteristics. It, pro excuse me, it prevented prohibited state government and uh, other government entities from having offices based on certain identity characteristics, uh, prohibited training on certain practices, uh, prohibited policies that promote differential treatment based on certain identity characteristics, and it prohibited certain uh, submissions of statements related to employment. So those were the speci specific things, among others, that the bill told state uh, entities, including uh, universities, uh, what they could and couldn't do in this area. A lot of people heard from that um, that maybe the state doesn't value diversity. Um, I had an employee tell me that they felt like, that maybe it, it felt like they couldn't say gay in the workplace anymore. Um, and that's, that's what they heard from this bill. Um, and so I think it's important to talk about where, where we go from here, what does it mean, and, and how do we accomplish our missions and vision uh, in an environment with that, where that is state law. Um, I looked uh, to the governor's comments about what he said as he summarized uh, his position on that bill and the bill that he signed. And there were several things that I'd just like to read to you because I think they uh, in, embody for me some of the things that we hope to continue doing uh, with this being our, the state law. He said, uh, we should celebrate our different cultures, different backgrounds, different experiences, different languages. All of those things make us richer and make us better. That's why diversity is so good. All of the studies show that if you get people who are different working together to solve a problem, they can actually solve that problem better than people who are the same. And so these are good things. These are worthy goals. He also said, we want everyone to come to the table, but it should be a potluck, right? Bring the best of you and the best of your culture and your background, and let's come together and let's have an amazing feast together. And lastly, he said, what last thing I want to share, he said, government can and must work to make sure that everyone has equal opportunity, regardless of race, gender, or sexual orientation. So as we looked as the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, how we were going to communicate the messages related to House Bill 261 uh, in relation to our goal uh, to provide services to all Utahns uh, and work on the health and safety of, of all Utahns, um, we sent out messages to our team that emphasized some of the following points. Um, that this does not stop, the bill does not stop our important work of serving in the public and meeting the goal that all Utahns will have fair and equitable opportunities to live safe and healthy lives. We will continue striving forward toward making this the safe, supportive workplace it needs to be. It's okay to disagree, and it, but we cannot do that with hatred, animosity, or abusive language. So what won't DHHS do? We won't skirt the law. Um, the bill specifically outlines things that we cannot and should not be doing, and we won't do those. But we don't need those things in, to be able to move forward our vision of uh, providing care and services to Utahns. We will continue to track and support data. Um, we have surveys, one, for example, many, many ways we do this, but one of the ways we do this is we, sur we have surveys, volunteer surveys of students in schools. Uh, and we will continue to administer those surveys and continue to track the data and publish that data. And we will collect and report that as we receive those, that information. And, and some of those information we, we ask students, um, things like their sexual orientation, their gender, those things, we will continue to, to track and report that information so that we as the citizens of the state of Utah know how uh, our, our students and how our children 
uh, are seeing things in the world and their concerns and how they're functioning in that environment. We'll continue to identify where there are uh, disparities in care and services in our community and continue to work to, to address those. Um, we know that the experience that someone has in a rural area may be different than someone in an urban area. We know someone who's uh, lower income may be having an experience that's different, different than higher income. Uh, we know that someone who speaks a different language may have different access to services than someone who's uh, more comfortable with English. We'll continue to look, identify those areas and continue to look and resolve those, find, find ways to be able to address those disparities. We'll continue to maintain our Office of Health Equity. Um, they do important work identifying these, these measures and we look, uh, they look for reasons why these different disparities may exist in our community. And most importantly, we'll continue to invite all Utahns to the table as we discuss the future of our programs and our services. We need the voices from everyone in our community as we decide how we're going to move forward and what services we're going to provide next. Our vision statement was crafted uh, 20 months ago when we merged, uh, before this bill was passed. Uh, and it still is about, has value and guides us today and I thought it would be helpful just to reshare that. The Department of Health and Human Services will advocate for, support, and serve all individuals and communities in Utah. We will ensure all Utahns have fair and equitable opportunities to live safe and healthy lives. We will achieve this through effective policy and a seamless system of services and programs. Another area that we faced uh, challenges or opposition or countervailing uh, pressures uh, was related to the Medicaid program and, our, and public health. One of the, the concerns that came up during the legislative session is the federal deficit. And the, as it continues to grow in larger size, uh, what does that mean for a state that is heavily reliant on federal funds? I talked about the size of the health and human services budget. The, the predominant part of that are federal funds. The Medicaid program, different parts of the program are funded two thirds to 90% with federal dollars. So do, do the legislators have a valid concern to say what, what, it, what could happen to the state of Utah if those dollars did not come through? Yes, de we definitely agree and we think it's worth reviewing and analyzing that. Uh, House Bill 51 passed, which encouraged stress testing that would say we as a, we as a state, uh, we as an organization should look and, and run through scenarios to see what might happen if those federal dollars don't come in as planned. Uh, and what are the likelihoods that those scenarios may happen. There was also a very controversial bill, House Bill 463, which proposed some very specific resolutions related to that. What did House Bill 463 get right? One thing that it should, we should do as a state, and we need to do more of, is that we should have a plan. At its core, 463 said, if things go bad, what, what is the state going to do to respond to these? And in that sense, it was on the right track. Uh, what did House Bill 463 get wrong? Uh, in part, it didn't include the community in helping decide what those items would be. What, what are the specific triggers that decides what is going wrong? Uh, what are the ways to remedy those? What are the things that the state will do if, the, if um, one of these situations happens? So we think there is an opportunity to continue that discussion. Uh, it just needed to happen in a different way. And, and we're happy that that uh, bill didn't pass and we have an opportunity to continue discussing that outside of the, that statute. There were some things that were very important to our department as we went into, their, went into the legislative session. We go through a process every year that starts uh, as early as May, uh, getting public input on what needs there are in our state related to our budget. Uh, we work with the governor's office through the fall and uh, get guidance from his budget in the December period uh, and then move into the legislative session to try to advocate for those things that we think will help uh, improve the health and safety of Utahns. This year, things we were focused on uh, was we have uh, disparate rates right now for what we pay for behavioral health for children that are in custody. In an oddly, and you know, bureaucracy and government work this way sometimes, oddly enough that some of our children in the most, most vulnerable circumstances were getting paid, their providers were getting paid rates lower than the general Medicaid population. And that was of, of issue and concern for us. Um, we have individuals, many individuals, leaving jails and prisons uh, that uh, end up in a cycle of recidivism 
uh, and don't receive the services they need as they're coming out uh, of, that, of those locations. And we want to be able to better uh, provide services for them so that they can treat their mental health issue and substance use issues. Um, we also uh, were looking to see if we could uh, continue building Utah's crisis response uh, for mental health, uh, looking at uh, having receiving another receiving center and additional uh, mobile crisis outreach teams. And in an environment where the legislature as a whole said that we're not, uh, there's not a lot of money and uh, things are not going to, you should not expect that you get, uh, would be able to get things that you're hoping for out of this budget. Uh, in, the, in the end, uh, many of those needs were ultimately covered in the state budget. Uh, we were able to uh, get approval to equalize the rates uh, for the children that are in services. Uh, we were able to establish a behavioral health commission, uh, which will be an important opportunity for all of those, everyone in, in this room and for citizens across the state to weigh in on where the state is going to be going related to behavioral health. Uh, the commission itself has, is per, uh, the predominant number of members are supposed to re represent consumers uh, rather than providers of the service. And uh, many of the commissions that are uh, councils that are already in existence in the state are being brought into that uh, environment so that we can have a single place to discuss next steps as a state and priorities as a state where we want to go related to mental health and behavioral health. In addition, uh, there was uh, an effort to potentially sell the state hospital. Uh, and again, there was an issue of process there. Uh, we think it's an important discussion to have about whether or not the current location and way that the state hospital is set up is the right way. We think that's an important discussion to have. Uh, one of the bills would have sold the hospital first and then uh, would have put into law that the hospital needed to be sold before we'd even done a study of what the impact of that might be. Uh, so we're happy that that decision was reversed and gives us the opportunity to continue discussion about what is the proper role of the state hospital in the state's mental health system. One of the other areas that uh, we received approval to move forward as related to uh, the Justice Involved initiative where we're going to be able to provide up to 90 days of service uh, to individuals before they leave at the jail or prison. Uh, and be able to carry on some services with them as, as they leave to be able to make sure that they're well integrated into the community uh, as they leave jail and prison. Uh, Jen Strohecker is going to talk a little bit more about that in a, um, a session later on today. So if you want to get a little bit more in depth into that, uh, it's an invitation to join that discussion. And she'll provide some more details as we go uh, down, that, down that path. Uh, lastly, I wanted to talk a little bit about our contracting process. Um, and as we look at how contracts have historically been structured, uh, they've primarily focused on outputs and saying, here are some things that if you do these things, we will make these payments for you. And while that's a very straightforward way of making, of making contracts and payments, uh, we often aren't able to measure after that whether or not we really are getting the outcomes we want. Uh, as we talk about looking at our uh, public media campaigns, uh, often they looked at the number of impressions that, were, that individuals had based off those media campaigns. So we would know, and our, our contracts are very good at measuring how many times somebody saw our billboard or estimates, how many times they saw the billboard or clicked on a link. Uh, but did, did that really result in people changing their behavior or, or an improvement in the health and safety of Utahns? Uh, and so given that environment, we are continuing to work and we know it's a bit of a, an art uh, in trying to figure out that right balance. Uh, we all want world peace, but we also know that uh, you may not, uh, as we contract with you uh, to help us with social media, that um, we may not be able to achieve that in a single contract. And so where do we find that balance of being able to look at improving quality, improving uh, measuring and paying for outcomes uh, while still finding something that, uh, through the contracts, uh, we're achieving the services that we, we want to receive. Lastly, I just want to sum and say, um, as we, as I talked at the beginning, there's often uh, different opposing forces in our life uh, as we move towards our goal. 
And we all recognize and celebrate when we have these breakthrough events in our lives, but not every time that we are moving through the different steps are we at a point uh, that we're at a breakthrough. Sometimes it's just simply it, we just are not getting pinned for the day. Um, and whether you're having a breakthrough moment or just trying not to get pinned, uh, we hope all of you will join us in our efforts to ensure that all Utahns have a fair and equitable opportunities to live safe and healthy lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nate, and your microphone's there. Yeah, so thank you so much for those comments and for reflecting that uh, that honesty and openness, really appreciate that. And we are gonna have an opportunity for questions from the audience if you all have any. I wanna just start off with a, with one or two to begin. Um, as your your last comments about moving the contracting into more of a outcomes-based and um, really looking at sort of the value uh, proposition, what are some of the challenges you see in terms of readiness for that? Um, what's the pathway to move that forward? And who do you need to be a part of those conversations? Yeah, thank you. I think one of the key issues related to that is that contract, as I mentioned, are often done on a very uh, delivery basis of saying, what is the output of what, you're, of what you're given? If we're saying that we want to do a survey, then it's how many people you surveyed. And historically, our contracts have paid based on, on those very distinct deliverables. Um, and so as we move to trying to say, well, what if we're seeking through the survey uh, to change behavior, how do we measure that? And what's the agreeable, agreed upon way that we can both say, yes, that's, that's a measurable and achievable delivery. So we really need to be working with our partners uh, in the community and the contractors to say, how do we find something that we can both agree that makes us, that gets us to that point? Great. Um, you mentioned the challenges that you face, the fires uh, ahead of you. As, as folks are thinking about how to work with you and your teams, what's, what's top of that list just so they know and in coming into you, this is where your heads are right now, you're going to move to some of those other things. Talk a little bit about what are the, what are the biggest fires for you right now this week. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, I mentioned uh, some of the other night I mentioned uh, sometimes our, the fires pick us, not we don't pick them. Uh, and this change healthcare experience has really been one that uh, we didn't have on our radar as we looked at our bingo card for March. Uh, <laughs> shutting down our pharmacy system was not on that and not part of our plan. Uh, and that, so that's been a key priority for us. Uh, like all, many of you have dealt with this in different ways and it's maybe impacted your organizations to different degrees. Uh, we received notice several weeks ago that uh, Change Healthcare, which is our pharmacy benefit manager for the Medicaid fee-for-service program, uh, was, was uh, closing down all of its systems in response to this cyber uh, attack. And that our members, when they went to the pharmacy, the pharmacy wouldn't be able to check their eligibility, uh, wouldn't be able to get payment for those services, wouldn't know um, whether or not the, the, they could even serve those individuals. Thankfully, we had some processes in place uh, where there were 72-hour medication plans where if an individual came in, uh, they knew that, that they could provide 72 hours of uh, medication right off the, out of the gate. We quickly modified that. We realized uh, as we had the initial discussions with change that this was not going to be a one or two day issue. Uh, so we were able to quickly send out messages and modify our direction to pharmacies so that they would uh, dispense 30-day supplies uh, so that members would be able to continue receiving those uh, drugs that they need. We also worked with our accountable care organizations. Uh, so uh, while our portion of the pharmacy benefit management was offline, uh, thankfully theirs uh, were up and running. Uh, and so we worked with them to be able to continue providing certain drugs through there and actually expanding the list of drugs that they, they provided to the members and we appreciate their partnership on that. Uh, we are still in the middle of, of this process. We still have uh, change healthcare is still not back online for us. Uh, we, there is some encouraging progress over the last uh, day or two where they've indicated that their system is, they've been able to bring up a portion of their system. Uh, we still need to do some testing related to that and we still need some additional functionality out of that system before we can have it go live. Uh, but there does appear to be potentially light at the end of that tunnel. Uh, but those, that's one of the things that has really jumped to the forefront for us, uh, you know, the, over the last couple of weeks that while 
all of, you know, many of those in the government community were focusing on the legislative session. Mm -hmm. A significant portion of our attention was shifted over just to try to make sure we were still getting uh, drugs to our members. That's a lot of stress. You also mentioned the merger. Many of us have been in, in those environments. Um, last question from me before other folks. How, how are your teams doing? Anything that you would want the folks in this room to know about uh, the agency itself and, and how it's doing on that? Yeah, thank you. And, and we really appreciate those that have partnered with us. We know our teams have been under extreme amount of stress during this period. I started with this list uh, that our agency as a whole, but in particular our Medicaid team uh, has gone through over the last uh, three or four years. Uh, and we really appreciate our staff, uh, the way that they've stepped up uh, to be able to continue to meet those demands on an ongoing basis. It is this commitment uh, to the vision of, of where we're going as a department that I think carries our teams through. Uh, if, if you've interacted uh, with individuals in government and in, in this area, I hope you've seen, because I do on a regular basis, the passion that these individuals have for serving Utahns. It's why they're with us. It's why they continue to stay with us uh, through these difficult times. Uh, and I think collectively, we're in this field because we want to be able to help and serve Utahns and help them be help, healthy and safe. Thank you, Nate. Any questions from, from out in the audience? Oh, looks like John here. John Pullman from the One Utah Health Collaborative. Nate, this might be kind of a delicious hy hypothetical, but let's say you go on vacation, right? Take a break. Sounds nice. Yeah, doesn't it? Um, and you come back and there are no emails and there are no meetings on your calendar for a few days and the staff is rested, I know. Um, and some of these fires, you know, redetermination, prism, like things start sliding out. What do you do, particularly in the Medicaid program, what do you start thinking about if you can be proactive? What would, what would you do? Yeah, thank you. That, that's a great question. And it is obviously so hard to prioritize uh, strategy decisions and next step discussions. Uh, but thankfully, even in these tough environments, we've been able to lean into some of those ideas. Uh, we're really excited about this Justice Involved initiative. Uh, it's an area where Medicaid has not been able to serve members in the past. The, the, there were federal prohibitions against us serving individuals that were in jails and prisons. And it left a gap. It left thousands of individuals, thousands of Utahns coming out of very difficult circumstances where they weren't connecting, have not been connecting well uh, with our behavioral health and substance use systems. And now we have the opportunity to lean in uh, and look at the 90 days before they, they are released, get them on the Medicaid program, start them in treatment and services, have uh, staff that actually help them coordinate their services as they come out so they're connecting those environments. Uh, so that's one of the things that we're super excited about. Uh, and so if I had the blank slate, that's one of the things that we would be working on. Um, another area that we're really excited about is this Behavioral Health Commission. Now, now the commission itself is great, um, but it really just represents the ability of our state to come together and have some really key discussions about where we want to go next related to behavioral health. We've been fortunate that the legislature has, over the years, provided funding on a repeated basis for different behavioral health programs. The opportunity is to get a, a little bit more of a cohesive strategy and prioritize where we're going to move through on those. We need to better integrate behavioral health services with our physical health services. So that's another area that uh, we are focusing on and I would prioritize if I had a few extra hours um, to continue to work in that area. We work with our managed care plans to figure out how to better bring in our behavioral health services. Currently, Medicaid has those divided for most members, that there's one contract for behavioral health services and another contract for physical health. We're working on ways to bring that together, and more importantly than the contracting, it really is down at the member level. Can they go in, and when they have a physical health visit, what is their access to behavioral health services? Because that's, for many individuals, they have both. And so to try to go through two completely different systems to get that, uh, what are the ways that we can incentivize areas to bring those services together? Um, you know, we've talked about community health centers, we've talked about uh, individual clinics that are looking at ways to integrate, but how do we incentivize that as a state? 
So thank you for that question. It's nice to dream. I hope uh, it I had a few free hours. <laughs> and the vacation was a nice dream, too. <laughs> I am confident that the themes we've been talking about so far this morning will come up repeatedly throughout the day. Um, and I really appreciate you starting us off so strong and with some great thoughts for us to think about going forward. Please join me in thanking Nate for his comments. Thank you.